High Recruit Conversations uh, brought to you by iSelect Fund, the Van Trump Report, uh, and the Yield Lab Institute. My name is David Yoakum. I'm an associate here at iSelect Fund, um, and I'm excited to welcome you all to today's call. Um, on today's call uh, for Agri-Food Conversations, we are joined by Bill Brady, the CEO of Kula Bio. They are doing some really exciting work in nitrogen sequestration um, uh, using microbes. Um, and I'm going to let Bill tell you all a bit more about that. Before we get started, um, some, some disclaimers. Each of you knows companies are more li likely to succeed with the right network of customers, talent, investors, and advisors. We have invited you to this because you are some of the smartest and most talented people in Kula Bio's market. You are potential customers for Kula Bio's products and services. You built and or sold the company similar to Kula Bio, or you are a sophisticated business person who understands Kula Bio's market and the challenges it may face. Before we get started, uh, we have a quick poll question to get a better idea of who we will have on the call today. Please take a few seconds to answer. Um, a few process comments first. We are not soliciting investment. This, in, this presentation is to provide information about Kula Bio's products and services to help them find customers, mentors, and other strategic relationships that can help them grow their business. You are all on mute. You can use the chat window to ask a question um, or the hand raising icon. After the formal part of the question, we will answer as many questions as time allows. And finally, this presentation is being recorded and will be available for replay. So without further delay, uh, I am pleased to introduce Bill Brady, CEO of Kula, of Kula Bio. Bill, please uh, take it away. Well, thank you, David. Um, and hello, everyone. Uh, as David mentioned, uh, my name is Bill Brady. I'm the CEO of Kula Bio. And we are based in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And uh, we are a bio-based nitrogen fertilizer company. And uh, more specifically, we use our microbes to uh, deliver nitrogen fertilizer that uh, we think is economically competitive and environmentally transformative. And so what I want to do with my time today is um, first state for you what we see as the problem uh, or the challenge that the world faces today with nitrogen fertilizer, then explain the Kula Bio technology, then tell you a little bit about our results to date on plants, um, talk a little bit about our cost competitiveness, um, and then a bit about our carbon footprint and the difference in our carbon footprint versus synthetic nitrogen fertilizer, and then ended up with a, an introduction to the team that is, is um, doing this, and then of course, open it up for questions. So um, I, I start with uh, some of the issues with synthetic nitrogen fertilizer. And I think there's really two big things. The first is it, it is very CO2 intensive when you look at it um, on a CO2 produced per ton of nitrogen uh, delivered. And the number is probably somewhere between three and four, three and four and a half. In addition to that, um, as many of you may know, uh, fertilizer is subject to runoff. And when nitrogen runs off, it ends up in our waterways, creates algae blooms, and is, is really a, a problem for aquatic life. So that's the bad side of synthetic fertilizer. The good side of it is, of course, um, we only have enough naturally occurring nitrogen to feed about half the people in the world. And so the amazing invention uh, of Haber-Bosch uh, provided enough nitrogen for the plants to grow the population from three and a half to seven billion. And for literally a century, it has provided that. Um, the issue is, as I mentioned before, it has a pretty difficult environmental footprint, number one. And number two, we're gonna need a heck of a lot more nitrogen um, to feed the population in the next number of decades. And we've gotta find some more sustainable ways uh, to deliver it. So we think biologics are, a, um, are an excellent solution to the, to the problem we face. So I'm gonna I'm gonna take you through the Kula Bio story, but I uh, I just want to start with giving you the why us 
and then we'll go through and talk about most of these in the following slides. Um, the first is we have an organic and sustainable source and a competitive cost. And, you know, I think farmers have been faced with the choice of sustainable and organic or economically competitive. And uh, we've, we're trying very hard and we think we've broken that trade off. Further to that, biotechnology for us is a huge performance lever. And so the more productive we get the microbes to be, the lower the cost becomes to deliver a pound of nitrogen. So it's a huge performance lever without cost attached to it. Also our approach, because we deliver nitrogen to the soil and not directly on the plant, uh, we're plant agnostic. And again, because we do it in that fashion, we are not limited to a seed coating um, and an incremental nitrogen addition, but we can replace all of the nitrogen that's used on farms. Uh, also interesting is our nitrogen production can be descaled. And as many of you may know, the Haber-Bosch production sites are huge, very capital intensive, centralized production facilities. We can we can decentralize almost all the way down to the farm level and not use, lose our competitive economics. And then the last point I'll make is um, while we have selected nitrogen first as, um, as a product for our microbes, we think that this technology, uh, which I'll explain to you in a second, can be extended to other agricultural application, microbial applications. So this slide um, is meant to depict what the real advantage um, of Kula Bio is. Using microbes for agricultural um, applications is not a new idea. The issue has been uh, in other attempts to use microbes is that when they're put in the soil, they either have to compete with existing native microbes for food and energy, or they have to attach themselves to the plant for food and energy, uh, both of which are okay, but it effectively limits the life of the microbe, how much food and energy it can get, and then how, how long it can live, and thus how much product it can deliver. So the Kula Bio approach and what we've done in our proprietary bioreactors is we have injected the microbes with their own independent source of energy. And then when sprayed in the field, the microbes draw on that independent source of energy to do their job. So they don't need to, they don't, they don't need food from the soil, they don't need food from the plant. Um, and we've injected them with enough, we've been able to inject them enough to date for them to last rather than hours or a day, two to two and a half weeks. And that's really the big innovation here. And I'll take you through the details of it, but this is the big innovation at Kula Bio. So here's, um, here's a picture of what happens in our bioreactor. Um, into the bioreactor goes water, uh, and a bit of a salt mix, and, elec and electrodes. Um, the microbes, and the microbes of course as well, the microbes will multiply um, off of the nutrition of the salt mix. And then when they have done so to our liking, we pull back on the nutrition mix, and under a little bit of stress, they start to consume hydrogen aggressively. Uh, and by the way, the electrodes split the hydrogen and oxygen from the water as the source of the hydrogen. And they combine that um, with CO2 from the air that we pump into the reactor. So as you can see, a pretty simple, um, pretty simple set of inputs, water, salt mix, and air. 
And what happens under stress is the microbes start to produce and store a bioplastic. And that bioplastic is what is the source of energy once they get into the soil. Um, I'll say a word about the bioplastic levels now and then we'll hit it again later. But um, at this point, we have the microbe storing roughly 10% of its body weight in bioplastic. And that 10% allows it to live for two, two and a half weeks. The theoretical max is that it can store up to 80% of its bio of its weight in bioplastic. Now, I don't know that we'll ever get to 80%, but to get from 10% to 20, 30, or 40, I think is a very realistic um, evolution of the microbe. And that, of course, would extend the life by two times, three times, four times. So this is what happens coming out of the bioreactor. Um, we simply then drain this bioreactor. There's no further post-processing step. And we spray that liquid, it's, a, it's an orange colored liquid, we spray that liquid on the soil. And uh, what then happens is the microbe uses the energy stored in the bioplastic to express the nitrogenase enzyme, which fixes nitrogen from the air and combines it with hydrogen to deliver NH4 to the soil um, in the same uh, kind of fashion that the plant is used to taking up. Another interesting feature that we've seen to date with the microbe is that um, when it senses nitrogen in its environment, it significantly slows down the production of nitrogen. And then when it senses a lack of nitrogen, it, it kicks into nitrogenase expression and kicks up its nitrogen production. So it is, in a sense, uh, a controlled release uh, type of mechanism. So I'll move on now to um, some of the results we've, we've had. Um, we've done two meaningful trials in greenhouses. The first was with radishes. And you can see that depicted here. If you look at the graph, A, the group of radishes under A, was the control, which was no nitrogen fertilizer. B was a low dosage, the equivalent of three pounds of nitrogen equivalent per acre. C is what we call the medium level, which was the equivalent of 30 pounds of nitrogen equivalent per acre. And D was high at 300 pounds nitrogen equivalent per acre. Um, so a couple of things on this. One is uh, the more nitrogen we added, the bigger the plants got. And so that was very encouraging. Um, the second thing is we also, and I, we don't have it on this chart, but we also um, had a control with urea, which was roughly equal in the low, uh, in the low case, roughly equal in the medium case, but the coolabile microbe outperformed in the high case relative to urea. Um, so I don't know that we can claim uh, from that radish trial uh, greater than urea performance, but we feel really confident, we felt really confident that we were delivering nitrogen in a very similar fashion to synthetics. So we then move to a lettuce trial. And um, this also was a greenhouse trial uh, with a uh, mixed lettuce species. And um, the first thing we did here was to see if we had the same impact. That is, if we continue to add more coolabile microbes, do the plants keep getting bigger? And as you can see from the graph, from the picture, and from the R squared number, it, it was pretty linear. The more we added, the bigger the plants got. Also in this trial, we compared it to a calcium nitrate control, uh, which I think is a, a favored fertilizer for, uh, for this type of lettuce. 
And if you uh, you look at those piles of lettuce we harvested, I think that was from 10, each of those from five or from 10 plants, I can't remember exactly. But again, A, um, that pile labeled A was no nitrogen. The pile labeled G was the calcium nitrate control um, at an equivalent of 20 pounds of nitrogen per acre uh, of calcium nitrate. And then B, C, D, E, and F were the um, coolabile microbe at different levels. Um, so you can either see by I that it's somewhere between E and F, or you can look at that graph up above that the actual crossover point was a little bit greater than the E dosage. Um, and then the other thing we did here, and you see this on the horizontal axis, is compared the cost. And so for calcium nitrate to get that pile of yield in G, the cost would be somewhere between $12 and $75 per acre. Now, I know that's quite a range, but what we did was we took the lowest possible calcium nitrate price we could find, which was rail cars, and, and that was a $12 point, cost point, price point rather. And the $75 was a smaller farmer who was buying from Yara at the retail level. Um, so obviously there's there's a range in there, but our cost to deliver the same nitrogen performance was also at about $12. And so the point there was just to show um, relatively close cost competitiveness. So from, uh, from those two uh, indoor trials, we have now moved to an outdoor trial. And the picture you see there is the actual farm and the product we delivered for the first application, which was at the end of May. Um, to the farm. Uh, so this trial is in Western Massachusetts. It is roughly 2,400 sweet corn and romaine lettuce plants. Um, and we are testing um, KM8. KM8 is the first product we have, the Kula Bio. KM is Kula Microbe 8. Um, and we have applied it uh, relative to a zero nitrogen control, uh, relative to a UAN control, and then a number of blends of Kula Bio and UAN, kind of 25-75-50-50-75-25. And we've got a whole battery of tests uh, that we'll do through the growing season. And you can see we've mentioned a few of them here on the slide. Um, so we did the first application. We are out on the farm again next week doing the second application and then um, and then we'll very anxiously wait to see how the plants grow and, and what the results are. We also have um, planned later in the year a greenhouse trial with one of the leading um, retailers in the United States. And we are doing a, an extensive and specific greenhouse trial on tomato plants, um, testing a whole bunch of environmental conditions. Uh, in addition to that, that this retailer is doing some compatibility testing of Kula microbes, specifically KM8, with some of their top um, selling products, because sometimes, as many of you may know, these retailers will do custom blends of different products. So um, we're excited about these two trials and um, what we can learn with those, combining it with the radish and the lettuce. I have a couple of slides on cost competitiveness here. Uh, and I'm gonna, before I talk through it, I'm gonna caveat it about a, a bit. Um, this is for our current product, our first product, which undoubtedly will be improved over time. But it is also early. Uh, Kula Bio has been 
in business for less than a year. So I would just say this is our view at this point in time, and it is likely to change over time. Um, but what you see here is our uh, costs compared to organic um, sources. And from what we've learned talking to organic farmers, that the price of compost, fish meal, poultry manure is somewhere between three and nine dollars per pound. That is per pound of nitrogen delivered uh, to the soil. And by comparison, the uh, cost per pound of KM8 today is 69 cents per pound. So um, we think there's a really strong value proposition for organic farmers. Um, in addition to the cost competitiveness, we have an ease of application um, appeal and we also don't have the pathogen risk that comes along with compost uh, and poultry manure. So likely as Kula Bio um, builds up our business and rolls out our products, likely our first target markets will be organics. Now, when we look at um, cost competitive, uh, competitiveness with urea, the picture, of course, gets a lot more uh, difficult. We, um, pulling from public data, um, estimate the cost per pound of nitrogen for urea to be somewhere around 25 cents per pound. And so we compare that to what we call KM9, which is, um, you remember KM8 had a two or two and a half week life. KM9 would have a five or six week life. Um, and we would do that by increasing the level of bioplastic. And if it did, it would have a price of roughly 23 cents per pound or roughly equivalent uh, to urea. And we think if we got to that level and um, we didn't have the runoff uh, issues that urea has, we'd have a very interesting value proposition, not just for organic farmers, but also those using synthetic nitrogen. Uh, and so, like I said, our plan is to start with organics, um, get experience on the farm, uh, keep moving down the cost curve with our bioreactor and keep extending the life of the microbe, and then eventually move into the synthetic area. Um, one of the other uh, interesting um, parts about our technology is our CO2 footprint. And so um, based on the inputs and the mass balance of our bioreactors today, um, we we've compared ourselves in this slide to Haber-Bosch. And so um, what we've done is we've uh, looked at an average size farm in the US, which we think is 400 acres. And maybe if we start on the right side, uh, if that farm is using Haber-Bosch nitrogen, um, Haber-Bosch emits about four pounds, in this case, 4.2 pounds of CO2 per pound of nitrogen delivered. Um, and that 400 acre farm might use 26,000 pounds um, per year. And so the CO2 emissions from that farm, from the nitrogen fertilizer alone, is about 109,000 pounds per year. Um, by the way, so we took a, we took a 60 or 65 uh, pounds of nitrogen per acre um, average. If you do the same analysis for KM8, it is a negative 0.614 pounds of CO2 for every pound of nitrogen delivered. And the reasons it's, it's negative is, if you remember back to that bioreactor, we are injecting air into the bioreactor, which of course has CO2. 
and the microbe is using that CO2 uh, to build up the bioplastic. And so it effectively gets sequestered um, into the soil. So using KM8 for that same farm, for that same 26,000 pounds of nitrogen per year, uh, that same farmer would sequester 16,000 pounds of CO2 each year. So uh, again, these numbers are bound to change as, as Kula Bio grows up and uh, solidifies it, its process. But I think this is indicative, and I think it'll probably won't be too far from this in, in the final analysis. And then, as I mentioned, um, our initial target is nitrogen. But if, if you take the core um, competency or the core value proposition of the Kula technology, it is all about uh, microbe life extension. And um, if we can extend the life of a microbe delivering nitrogen, we can do the same for phosphorus. By the way, we have done that on phosphorus already. Um, we can do it for many crop protection microbes. And we, you, might have, you might imagine we've been approached by some crop protection microbe companies with that idea. Um, and then over time, we think land reclamation, um, particularly in some of the really difficult parts of the world like China, could be a really interesting, impactful application for our microbe. But the idea here in this slide is uh, over time, we think to build the enterprise, we'll likely use this technology competency over a wide variety of ag applications. So let me wrap it up with a little bit about the people. Um, um, my partner, Kelsey Sakamoto, and I started this company last September, uh, September 2018. And we took the technology out of the laboratory of uh, Dan Nocera. And Kelsey Sakamoto, my partner, was in Dan's lab and courageously left academia for crazy small startup company world. Um, but it came out of the lab of Dan and Dan in close collaboration with Pam Silver. Pam is also um, uh, well known for her work in synthetic biology. Um, and and uh, Dan's been working on what he called the artificial leaf and then the bionic leaf for, I don't know, I think a decade. Um, and this nitrogen idea is a cousin of those uh, of those efforts. And so, Kula Bio, in in taking uh, the technology out of Harvard, not only got the IP, of course, but we got the benefit of the te technology foundation that Dan built over time um, to take into Kula Bio. So we're really fortunate for that. Um, Dan and Pam remain advisors to the company, and Dan in particular is, is very active in the company. And then finally, this is, um, this is um, the rest of the Kula Bio team at this point in time. It's, it's me there on the right, um, and Kelsey on the left, and in the middle, Megan, Jimmy, and Sophie, um, who have a combination of chemical engineering uh, and soil science back, uh, backgrounds. Um, and we are actively seeking more, uh, more great technologists like, like these guys uh, to build out the team. So I hope that gives you a uh, good overview of the Kula Bio uh, approach, the Kula Bio process, and a bit of where we are in terms of our technology and um, and our performance results. So I think I'll stop there, uh, and I would be more than happy to uh, answer any questions or take any comments. Great. Well, uh, Bill, uh, this is David. Thank you so much for um, such a fantastic presentation. Obviously, some really exciting and interesting work you guys are doing. Um, while we wait for the audience to get warmed up with any potential questions, um, I will go ahead and kick things off here just to get the conversation rolling. You know, Bill, one thing that's really interesting about sort of the world of microbials and bioactives is, 
you know, this decision between single microbe solutions and microbial consortia. Um, how has that played into your guys' decision making at this early stage as, as a company that's working with a single microbe? And it, as you, as the company develops, do you see there being applications inside of consortia or are you guys working in that capacity or do you see this being sort of a single microbe production type of uh, company? Well, we might get there. It, there. We've certainly done some work. We have certainly done uh, some thinking in that area. Um, we had we had a very strong bias from the get-go to, to keep uh, what we were doing uh, to, to eliminate as much complexity as possible. Number one, because we needed to be cost competitive. Of course you need performance. Of course you need a good um, environmental footprint. But you know we, we had to be honest with ourselves in what we were hearing from all the farmers we talked to, which was we are very interested in all these sustainable solutions, but we're not gonna go broke uh, doing so. so we definitely had a bias towards single microbe simplicity, um, which kept our bioreactor simple, which kept our input simple and, and, and keeps our cost down. Um, I suspect, and, and I hope we can stick with that single microbe for nitrogen uh, and maybe for phosphorus. I suspect when we get into some of the crop protection areas, when we get to land reclamation, we may have to move beyond that. Um, but that's that's how we're thinking about it currently. Got it. It's a, well, it's it's an interesting segue. You mentioned land reclamation because obviously, Kula's microbe has novel characteristics. Not only that it being a robust organism, but in it being one that has a ha, that sequesters nitrogen, uh, I guess, and, car, and carbon as well, but is a nitrogen sequestering organism. Um, when you start thinking about other markets, obviously the nitrogen market is enormous. When you start thinking about land reclamation as a possibility. Does that become an application for microbes that you are that you currently have in development, or does that push Kula Bio into developing other microbes for those applications? I think I think it more than likely pushes us into other microbes. Um, we have had um, um, I can't say too much about this, but I would just say that we have had very strong interest from the largest. Um, one of the largest fertilizer and ag companies in the world who, uh, whose parent happens to be in China. Uh, and that'll probably give 99% of our, of who's on the call, a pretty good idea what I'm talking about. Um, but we have had tremendous uh, interest from them on this land reclamation issue. And as we've started to get into it with them, man, is it complex. Um, because you likely need a solution uh, to clean up the land first, which is largely metals and then hydrocarbon, hydrocarbons, and then you get to the nutrition, putting nutrition back into that soil. So, um, so I suspect, you know, when we get to that level of land reclamation, it will, it will, it'll be multi-microbe for sure. And ha how that exactly manifests itself or deploys, I don't know, but I am sure it's going to be. It's a complex problem, so it'll be a more complex solution got it that makes sense um the one question we have from the audience is 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 there any concern about residual bioplastic left in the soil i don't think so i don't think so uh from the testing we've done to date um what happens is that the microbe uses up most of the bioplastic and uh pretty much just leaves residual carbon in the soil which then just becomes a carbon source in the uh, in the soil. So, um, from what we know so far, and this has all been indoors, uh, that is not an issue. Uh, we're going to get another set of data in this outdoor trial that I described, um, and that's one of the things we'll we'll be watching closely. Got it. Um, and one one thing I was just curious about in the presentation was sort of how you guys did the um, carbon sequestration um, calculations and sort of what the, obviously the Haber-Bosch is a well understood process. Just curious to know how you guys went about making those calculations. Um, well, that, that's the subject of another webinar, I think. We could, uh, you should see the spreadsheet <laughs> on, that, on that one. Got it. <laughs> it, it was really complex. But basically, 
basically it was a little it was a bit of a mass balance analysis of um, of how much air and CO2 the microbes are taking in um, and converting it to bioplastic and then sequestering in the soil. So uh, yeah, it was we went round and round and round on that. Uh, as I mentioned when I used the slide, I I'm sure those numbers are not exact at this point, but I think they're indicative. And I think we are undoubtedly a carbon sink to some extent. Got it. Okay. Um, another question we have from the audience is, is you mentioned that the nitrogen fixation will stop or would stop with nitrogen um, with nitrogen sources in the soil. I think that's you know a problem that someone like a pivot bio is trying to solve is how do you wake up microbes that are in the presence of, of nitrogen? Um, do your microbes fix nitrogen regardless of whether there's nitrogen in the soil? What we've seen to date is that when there's excess nitrogen in the soil, uh, our microbe significantly slows um, the nitrogen fixing mechanism. Uh, I'd, we have theories on, on, uh, on, on why it does that, but there's work going on as we speak to fully understand it. Um, so, so we've seen that uh, over time. Uh, the other thing we've seen is um, kind of a residual effect of our microbe um, d delivering nitrogen for a long time. So it, long after, uh, or not long, but after a meaningful time, after synthetic nitrogen is taken up entirely, for example, in the lettuce trial, uh, we were still delivering nitrogen to the plant. So, um, so it's something that we we see um and we're um we're confident on a macro level but we're working on it now to really understand the mechanism got it um one other question we have from the audience here uh what what is left to prove in the technology before commercializing um i, I think i think we have to um stress the microbe on what it might face out in the real world meaning um, ranges, of P, so ranges of pH um, of the soil, meaning uh, ranges of, of temperature and ranges of moisture levels. We don't have any indication that those are problems, but I think before we, um, before we ask any farmer to, to use it, I think, I think we've really got to stress the microbe and then get much uh, more specific about the application uh, parameters. The, um, the uh, trial we're doing with the major retailer on tomatoes later this year, we're gonna do a lot of that. It's gonna be a indoor simulated conditions, but we're gonna do a lot of stressing the micro. Um, so that'll be, a good, that'll be a good body of data, but, but that's one thing. On the product side, that's one thing. Um, I think KM8, as we know it today, has worked and delivered nitrogen in meaningful quantities time and time again. Uh, but I think stressing it, number one. And then the second thing is that we are running uh, our bioreactors in roughly the 20 liter range, plus or minus. We have, um, we have eight bioreactors and they're some a little bigger, some a little smaller, but roughly 20 liters. Um, you know, we took it out of Harvard at a, I think, 0.4 liter uh, scale. So we're up to 20. But I think we need to get the, those bioreactors up to 100 liters, which is our goal here by the end of the year, and then up to 1,000 liters um, so that, you know, so that we can make it at scale. Got it. Well, um, Bill, before we sign off here, we always like to ask our entrepreneurs what can the audience do to help you out here and how can they reach you? Well, um, one thing I would say is um, for the growers, um, whether you would be interested in this or not, uh, I would love to know your reaction, your feedback and, you know, kind of, hey, if you want to be serious with growers, you had better do this or do that. Because we learn every time we talk to a, to a grower. Uh, I would say the same for the industry experts who have been through this with other products. I'd love to know the things I need to be looking around the corner for. Um, so those, those are things would be extremely helpful to, to me and the team. Um, and I can be reached uh, quite 
simply at Brady, B R E D Y, uh, at coolabio.com. And uh, I'd love to hear from I'd love to hear from you all. Um, and, right. I, and I really, really appreciate you all taking time to listen to our story. Fantastic. Well, Bill, we really appreciate you you telling us the story. I know I've heard it uh, many times and we're excited about what you guys are doing. Um, but uh, to everyone else in the webinar today, thank you for participating on the webinar. If you would like to learn more about Kula Bio, please let us know by answering the following poll question. Um, we host these webinars uh, every week at 3 p.m. Central Time. Uh, you can register for the Agri-Food Conversations webinar series by going to agrifoodconversations.com. A uh, replay of this webinar will be emailed to you in the next 24 hours. And if you know others who may want to see the webinar and replay, they will be able to access it on agrifoodconversations.com in the next 24 hours. But thank you, Bill, and thank you to the rest of the, our listeners today. And we look forward to seeing you next week. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.